sounds out with a kind of reassurance. Reassurance for whom? Who is he trying to reassure? It is the disciples. They are feeling very much alone at this stage. They feel that they are losing their best friend. They feel that they are going to be alone in the world. And here Jesus opens up to them and tells them that if you keep my commandments, I will be with you. I'll be with you forever. I am not going to leave you up there. That must have reassured them in many ways. Especially when they felt that when he leaves, we are alone. What do we do now? How do we explain this man to other people now that he's not with us? We will not see the signs, the miracles, the things that he was able to do before to back up what we say about him. But yet, at the same time, he tells us that he is only with us always. When he means, when he uses that terminology, I will not leave you often, he is using that idea that I will be with you always. I am not leaving you. I'm going to send you someone to help you. We're coming up very close now on Pentecost Sunday, where we hear about the Holy Spirit sent of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples. I will ask the Father to send to you an advocate. Now that's a nice way of putting it. We have many names for the Holy Spirit. When we see the advocate, we also see the penalty, the consoler. And I'm not sure in any other names they have placed upon it. But we use three normally. The advocate, the consoler, and the patentee. All of them, of course, are all pointed directly at consolation. I'm going to send you someone who will give you consolation, who will show you the way to me, who will assure you of the things of this world that I am the one who has created them. And that even death itself does not separate us. Because through this advocate, you will understand exactly what I want you to understand. Now, that's a powerful message. That's the message that we sometimes take for granted in our own understanding of our faith. We look at death in many ways as a complete separation of the individual. And death itself is a separation, yes, from the physical realm to which the disciples also suffer in that way. They saw Jesus going up up into heaven, and yeah, they are on the phone. That physical touch, that physical person to which they had attached themselves to, had gone. And in many ways, we too have that same attachment to our loved ones. When they pass from this world to the next. C.S. Eliot tells us, and I quote, he advises us from the fourth quarter, they call it. We must be still, and still moving, into another intensity. For a further union, a deeper communion. But what we should be? The path of reflection. This day, possibly, is outside the range of everyday comprehension. When we
we try to ponder it, our minds are blocked. How should we unlock them in order to continue to the future? The only way that we can unlock our minds is through the understanding of God's love. Through the fact that we already understand that He is with us, the real presence of Christ. It's a hard thing to expect people to explain to them. When you ask the people in general the presence of Christ, they're not able to give you a definitive understanding. Their minds are blocked from seeing the presence of Christ. That's something we are missing. If we understood truly and could see the real presence of Christ in our lives, our whole lives, our whole demeanor, our whole being changes. Because we become united in a deeper with it, with Christ. Christ has given us himself. At every hour, in every minute of the day, there is a mass being said somewhere in the world. And he is made present at that time throughout the world. We don't see the Eucharist as just a piece of bread. It is the presence of Christ. It is the presence of our Father. Once you see our Father, that unites us to the understanding that we are not often, that we are belonging to something, something greater than ourselves. Another intensity, as T.S. Eliot would put it. In fact, it is a huge intensity. It goes beyond beings at times. To be able to feel that intensity of unity with Christ. Very few people have actually experienced it fully. I would safely say that Saint Mother Teresa, for instance, she experienced that intensity. Saint Teresa of Avila. Saint Teresa of the Little Flower. St. Francis of Assisi and other mystics who have come to understand the presence of God has opened their lives to be saints. We are on that road, by the way, each and every one of us. We're all trying to become saints, I hope. And as we do so, our intensity with Christ should grow. It's not something that is static. It's not something that is just come to a certain point in our lives and it stays there. We come to a point of comfortness in our consciousness. And we don't want to push the envelope any further. Why? Because it is a scary place to go. It means having to reject things that we call the truth. It means to have to accept something else that is true. And when we accept something that is true, that changes everything from the presupposition we were in. Now they're nice words, anyway. <laughs> Presupposition, change, and all that kind of stuff is nice. But what do you mean? It means that when we have something new, it has overlapped the thing that is old. And it replaces it. So if we're stuck on one level of consciousness, we never get beyond that. We don't experience 
something new. The Eucharist is an experience of something new each and every time that you receive it. It is the ultimate experience. But if your mind is locked, you're not able to see that sort of seer presence, then the experience does not affect you. And the only way we can actually change that is to allow ourselves to grow, to accept, to move forward into God's presence. Just like the disciples say to the day they accepted that Christ had promised them that he would be with them. And he is. Right here. At every mass that we say. He is here in every sight of love. In every charitable moment that we do. He is here. It's an honor to in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.